Hello and welcome to this special edition of the Spectrum Show where I interview Chris Wilkins from Fusion Books. In the interview, Chris talks about many things, predominantly Crash. Chris having recently obtained the IP for Crash Magazine from Future Publishing. I apologise for the small amount of background noise on the interview. This was caused, I think, from my microphone. Chris and I also got interrupted by a telephone call while we were interviewing. I managed to take most of the background noise out, but there is the occasional kind of scraping noise. Sorry for that. So here's the interview with Chris. It's really interesting, and I hope you all enjoy it. So welcome, Chris. Thank you for agreeing to come on the Spectrum Show. I think uh, I think it's well overdue, this. I, I've been longing to be on this show for many, many years. Well, I'm very pleased that you agreed to come on. So it's good for good for both of us, then. By way of an introduction to your, yourself in the interview, could you kind of give us a bit of a history of Fusion Books and the kind of things that you currently offer? Yeah, sure. I, I can probably go way back before then, I guess. I mean, it, it all started, I think, when Marty and Carol and Retro Gamer arrived in the newsagents. I, I, I still remember to the day, I think it was down in Stratford-upon-Avon, down in the WH Smiths there, seeing this magazine called Retro Gamer on the newsstand. And if you remember the issue one, it was all kind of roughed around the edges. They, they, yeah. they did it to make it look old. And I'm thinking, well, how long has that been there for? Six months, eight months? How did I miss that? I remember getting that and, and then getting hooked on it and then getting that every month and just sort of being teased back into the retro world. I mean, this, this is going back to, what, 2003, 2004? So just acknowledging the fact, I think, there, were, there, was, there was retro gaming out there. I think I dabbled yeah. with a few emulators up to that point, but nothing too serious. So getting back into, into retro, attended, do you remember CG back in 2004, 2005 in Croydon? Uh, I remember going to that, meeting Matthew Smith for the first time, because um, he turned up at um, set the second event. Uh, meeting Archie he... McLean for the first time, meeting the, the Oliver twins for the, or Andrew yeah. Oliver for the first time. So there, there was lots of first times, I think, back back in back in 2004, 2005. Yeah. I dabbled then making arcade machines, I think about that time as well. So my, my interest in retro was sort of starting to burn again, uh, mm-hmm. or, or the old systems again. Mainly the Spectrum, because that's the, that's the computer I had uh, when I was 13 on that Christmas morning, you know, opening the packaging and playing Manic Miner and Luna yeah. Jetman. Those are the first two games I ever had. But then getting back into the whole thing. So we did we did an event called the Retro Ball, which was soon after the first Croydon show. Yeah. So the template was arcade machines, pinballs, uh, lots of retro system stalls. We did that in a cricket club in Kenilworth, just down and around the corner from where I live. And, and that that's where I met Richard Joseph, Richard Joseph, John Hare, David Whitaker came, Rob Hubbard came, Archer, and various other people to do the talks. And and that's it. Sort of carried on from there. I did a magazine called Retrofusion because I yep. wanted to give out a magazine to those who attended. Microsoft Publisher. It was 28 pages, very very rough, very fanzine. You know, it, it was what it was. Something to take away. You know, the, the people that came. So that was my first dabble in magazines. Didn't know what bleed was, didn't know what any of those kind of printing kind of terms were. So there's like white borders around the magazine because publisher doesn't do bleed. So very, very fancy a niche. But then we, what we did then, we, we did um, a deal with GameStation and, we, and we, we started to use InDesign and put a little bit of a company around it. And we did three copies of Retrofusion, which went out into the shops. I was made up at that point, um, but then I think family took over. We had my son, who's now 14, and everything became a little bit too much. So that was the end of Retrofusion as we knew it back then. Yeah. Always wanted to, to dabble. We did another We did another issue three, which was done by, how did I do that? I think it was Indiegogo back then, when before Kickstarter was a thing in the UK. And then there was always this idea as well i think when play expo started i did oh, i did another event in 2008 where i met sandy white and yeah. some bullfrog guys again very small we're talking 120 130 people so that i kept the retro thing going collecting and playing and just 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 toying so fast forward then so play expo came along i met craig turner which uh, we had this idea of doing a new event and that became revival and yep. all wrapped around all that was the fact that Kickstarter was also then being launched in the UK. So this was about end of 2012, early mm. 2013. So we we did, I, I got to know Roger Keane as well over the years, being a Crash 
boy way back. I think I got to know Matthew Uffendall first purely. I can't even remember how I got to know him. He might have been on mm. Facebook. But then by accident, I bumped into Roger just ringing up the old Thalamus offices asking to, to speak to Matthew and Roger answered. So he, he's blamed me for stalking him all, this, all, all these years. <laughs> and it, it probably was, probably probably felt like that back, back in that time. But I've known Roger a long time. And then I think when, when the time came back in 2012-ish, I asked Roger if he would be interested in in doing a book together. And that's, that was the, the the first sort of conversations we had on creating the, the history of Ocean, Ocean Software. Yeah. Because we called the old magazine Retrofusion, all I did was then switch the words around to Fusion Retro. And that's how Fusion Retro Books was sort of born after we created this first Ocean book. And then yeah. we sort of wrapped a company around it and then tried to figure out what to do next. The follow-up was Book on US Gold. So meeting up with Jeff Brown in a pub. I can't remember where the pub was, but it was over in the, the West Midlands somewhere. And, and then talking US gold. And then thereafter, we, we, we created other books and the rest is history, I guess. So how many books in total have, is it Retrofusion? Right. Retrofusion books? Yeah, this is, this is a tongue twister now, isn't it? So you call yeah. it Retrofusion for donkeys, donkeys years. And then it's Fusion Retro books, but a lot of people call, still call me Retrofusion. Yeah, I think I think uh, the retro sort of flows a little bit better, doesn't it? If it's the first word. Lots of retro things you put retro. Yeah. At the start, yeah, you, you, the almost get retro. Used, you get used to seeing it that way, I think. Yeah, just, just to be different. We, we call it fusion retro just to make it a little bit different, similar, but different to what were gone before. So we I, I left. I don't, sometimes I have to go on the website just to remind myself. So we did Ocean first, which was a big hit. Uh, the US Gold book was the follow up, which which was quite successful as well. Yeah. We did we done three volume uh volume spectrum books. The spectrum in pixels. Yeah, ones. so we yeah. so did the first one which um which which was proved proved to be very popular, but being a specy boy, I wanted to mm. do more. So in the end we did volume two, volume three, covered many more games, talked to many more developers, and covered quite a few different aspects of the spectrum. Yeah. Did a reprint of issue one then, the volume one a bit later on and created a hardback version as well. We did a, a little book of Spectrum games, which again is a, it was meant to be one of those things you get for Christmas in your stocking. Yeah. yeah, so something you can just flick through, see one image and a bit of description on the game. Did the same for the Commodore 64, just done the one volume there. Done the yeah. same on, on the Amiga, just which we did a reprint before Christmas. That that's mm. the, the Amiga scene is kind of really buoyant at the moment. We we did a, a reprint or a new version of the fantasy art of Oliver Frey. And we had, I think, about 40, 50 new pages, lots of the later art that Ollie did. So we, we've done a lot of stuff in the in the book world. Then having done Retrofusion all that time ago, there, there was a hunger still to do a magazine. Roger kept on telling me I was crazy and, and telling me not to do this, not to have the commitment on doing a monthly magazine or a bi-monthly quarterly. Because I guess with his experience and stuff he did back in Newsfield, he knew the kind of demands, the pressures, I guess. You know, the, the, you yeah. do one magazine and the time comes around very, very quickly for the next one to go out. But um, we, we, so what we did, we, we went over to Ludlow, myself, my wife, Steve Day, Roger and Ollie, we met them because mm. they were they were attending the local bookshop just to do some promotion on the the, the new fantasy art of Oliver Frey. So we were all in in, in the, this bookshop for a couple of hours, and lots of people came and we met and signed and various things. And the, then we went to one of the pubs, which for the life of me I can't remember the name, but it was it was one of the pubs with a beer garden that all the Newsfield guys used to go to, into back in the day. You know, the Zap guys, the Crash guys. So the wife was there and broached the question again you know why you know should we do a magazine and then my wife just said to me said to the group why don't you do an annual and then i just then said well is there any reason why we can't do a crash annual or a zap annual and that's how i how that idea was born you know just over a couple of beers yeah. in the sun talking in the old days and then we went away from there then and yeah we, we created the first crash annual i think that's 2017 four years ago now is it four years i think i have them all i i've got 18 19 and 20 yeah so there's the 18 there's the 19 and there's 20 there's the 21 oh, 21 yeah, yeah we, we just skipped 20 looking back maybe that's something we shouldn't have done but i've seen people's bookshelves with 18 19 21 and it look, looks like there's one missing we should really go back shouldn't we and fill the gap yeah funny what you said about the little book of spectrum games being a stocking filler i've had two of those bought for me for christmas 
Love you. Uh, right, there uh, you go. And I've also got all three volumes of the ZX Spectrum in pixels as well. The standard of writing in the Fusion books is excellent. Is it difficult to keep such high standards of the standards of writing? So, so what, what I find I do, well, mm. with, with, with the annuals, Roger has been the editor. Yeah. So I tend to be the, the content coordinator, for a yeah. better word. You know, I, I think, well, what could be in this issue? What's, what's happening in the Spectrum world at the moment? Oh, wouldn't it be great if it was this? What, what haven't we done before? Yeah. And you have those kind of you, you're walking the dog or you're, you know, you, you, your mind's drifting and you're thinking, well, you know, what could make a good cover? What, what could be what could make a good article? Yeah. So that, that, that's the first thing. So I think over the years, I, I've got to know many people. You sort of know who you can rely on, who you can get yeah. to write certain features. For example, Martin Carroll, Gray Mason, Paul Davis, Gordon King. There's a whole yeah. there's a whole raft of people now who who write for for Crash. And the, and the articles come in. So I tend to do a first pass, and then you've got Roger, then who is the who's been the editor of Crash and Zap up until the last series of annuals. You know, Zap is yeah. coming out next month, and Crash has come out before Christmas. They they edit as well. They 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 proof, they edit, and they look through. Once that's done, there is another layer of proofing after that by a guy called Gareth Birch. Yeah. So he is very very thorough. If the if the quality of the the writing coming in, because not everybody is a writer, you know, but everybody yeah. we were looking for people with passion, yeah. So if there's passion coming through in the writing, we 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 can we can make the 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 writing or, or the the grammar, you know, we could we could bring it up a level to fit into the the quality of the rest of the the publication. So yeah. we haven't always got to do that, you know. The but 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 that, those are the other layers are there, making sure that what what the end product is, you know, is, is as best it can be given the time we've got. It's not always perfect, you know. We we put out the annual, and it's it's amazing, really, that you get it back in print, and then you you find the other ten things you've missed, you know, within seconds. But we try and get ninety nine point whatever percent of the the problems yeah. fixed, and we 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 reach for a very high standard, and yeah. we do that across the annuals, and we we've, we've got layers of proofing and quality layered into all the other publications we're doing as well. But you know, there's always examples of where mistakes or something's been missed. Yeah. You get you get a little bit blind, I think, on the screen to many it's, things, and, and sometimes the time pressures you've just got to get it out because yeah. you're like you've got a couple of thousand people waiting for something. It's it's not luck, it's by design, and it's hard work uh, by the sounds of it. Chris, yeah, there's, but, there's a lot yeah. of hours going in. Yeah. A lot of, we, we've just put Crash Issue Two out uh, literally, and I spent we spent a whole two days into the evening proofing it. You know, and that's that's a, that's even a smaller thing than the annual. Yeah. 60, 60 pages and it took absolutely ages and i'm sure you know somebody will get the printed copy and spot something there's always something jeff always yeah. something and you, you you sort of you just take a sharp and take a breath when you see it you know thinking oh, you know how do i miss that but um we, we strive for very high quality and and uh, i think people or the feedback is that's recognized and yeah. we we appreciate that it is. I mean, you you can you can tell, and I do. I think I've noticed hardly any errors in any of the books. I've got quite a few of your books, Chris. So I've, <laughs> okay, I've noticed hardly any errors in any any of them. I won't I, tell you what they are, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, usually, it it tends to be a silly thing. Like there's just a, a one an A missing or a D missing or something like that. It's normally something some conjunctive yeah, missing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we, we've not uh, done anything um, which changes the old essence. Well, introducing the word Commodore 64 into a Spectrum book instead of the word Spectrum. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you don't want to do that. Yeah. So, so you had a Spectrum back in the day. I'm guessing from what you said, you got it Christmas 1983? Yeah, I think it was 83. I must have been 14 then. I remember this guy who was a, well, became a friend in school at the time. He, he was in a geography class and he had helped the teacher by by writing this application to capture data on this computer which turned out to be the spectrum so you know he was um he was the school i won't say nerd as such but he was the guy who was into computers way before yeah. anybody else knew the existence of them and it, it just captured my imagination that he did this thing you put data in and the spectrum would draw a graph yeah or something i can't yeah. remember what it was about it was maybe been about i don't know rock surfaces or something in in in, in the geography space yeah. So, so I asked this guy. Um, I, I, weirdly, I've gone back in touch with him very lately. He'd noticed like I got the IP for Crash, and and he he was talking about the irony of it all. You know, <laughs> I got into all this. 
So, so I remember asking him how he did this and mm. his programming and the spectrum and all this stuff. And then, as you do, you ask your parents for a, a computer for Christmas. It was it was the big buzzword at the time. It would help with homework and education and all that kind of bribery chat you would say to your parents at the time. And and thankfully, I remember my mother going into Smiths and, and she was going to buy a 16k one. But I, I remember this guy telling me, make sure you get the 48k one. You know, blah blah yeah. blah. And that's what I got for Christmas yeah, that year. My friend recommended me to get Manic Miner and Luna Jetman. He, he knew, I didn't know how he knew these were good games, but he mm. knew these were good games. And those are the two games I had Christmas morning uh, uh, on 1983. I persuaded my, this, this is this is the cunningness, I persuaded my mum to allow me to open the Spectrum a few weeks earlier just to make sure it was okay in quotes. You know, it was, it was <laughs> yes. I, I, was, I was craving it. I, I was, yeah. it, it, it engulfed me. I, I couldn't wait to get it. So, so I remember playing it or loading up one of the, the Horizons programs, and 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 that's that, that was probably mid December 1983. That was my, yeah. on my on my parents' telly in the living room, which was probably what a 14 inch Ferguson color, wherever it was back then. Yeah, I w- I was absolutely made. I really was. I, I, I Christmas that year was incredible. So, and, yeah. and did you did you continue with the spectrum then how did you just have your original one did you move on to a one to eight model or was it just that first one that you had well it's the, fir- the first one uh, then then I, the following christmas i had the zx microdrive expansion kit yeah uh, along the way i i was peppering my 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 spectrum with gifts um i, I remember having yeah. the cover speech synthesizer was it the kempston mouse as well yeah. and using OCPR Studio, is that right? I think so. Yeah, or, or one yeah. or one of the art studios. It's the same guy that did the Fairlight games from the edge. I can't. I, yeah. yeah. So using a mouse. Where else did I have for it? Alpha Com 32 printer. I bought then a DK Tronics keyboard. Yeah. And so everything went in there. You know the interface yeah. and all the bits went in there, and, and that that was my setup then. Remember getting a micro driver? I don't know if you remember that. It was the the device before the multiface. So I never had a multiface. I had something called a micro driver. So I had that. So so yeah, I was made. And then and then as time goes on, I, I, I wrote I would say I wrote my O level project in Yor Sinclair Mega Basic, saving all the the listing to to micro drive. That was my O level sort of project. And then they will you know they will. The one to AK sort of came and went. Uh, yeah. Before that, the Spectrum Plus. I was tempted on getting a keyboard because you could you could spend twenty quid back in those days and just buy the keyboard, and then you'd put all the the bits of yeah. your Spectrum inside. But I had the the, T, the DK Tronics keyboard, so I was happy with that. So I then remember selling all of this to a neighbour just so I could buy a Plus Two. So it was the oh. it was the, the grey one, you know, the one before yeah. the black. One. It was the first model. And, and I, I love the music, even even though the beeper chip back in those days was a little bit, what's the word, <laughs> beeperish. Yeah. But you'd have certain games like Age and X, which could show you what the beeper could do, like yeah. you know, the music by Tim Follin. So I, I was intrigued by the 12AK, the AY chip, the music of the Plus 2. So I had a Plus 2 for, for, for a while then, maybe a year, a couple of years. I remember getting a, a Plus 3 very briefly. Uh, when they were like in the the bargain 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 bins of comic yeah yeah so i had that briefly and i can't remember what happened to those but i went off to uni then or to do, to do my degree those were the the four years or so where i didn't really do much gaming it was all about studying and getting qualifications yeah so i so i had i went all the way up to the plus three really but i, I can't remember what happened to them. i remember selling all my kit to get the plus two yeah i can't i can't remember what happened to the plus two and i can't remember what happened to the plus three they so, may yeah. still they may still be in your parents' attic or something like that. So. Possibly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then I moved into the the world of the Amiga after that, and that's that. That was my path. I went from Sinclair all the way up through to the Plus Three, briefly, and then yeah. I got myself an Amiga 500, a 1200, and I went down that route. So why the interesting crash? I think you mentioned you got it back in the day. Yeah. So so I I, I remember buying my first game after getting my spectrum for christmas yeah you used to go into smiths or woolworths or boots yeah. and there used to be a whole section for all the different computers out yeah. on the market but this is but you all you would see is these little cassettes black, empty cassette 
cases with these i don't know very attractive designs on, yeah. on, on the front uh, promising you entering this world and that world i i didn't know what to buy i i mean i, I remember getting devils of the deep i don't know if you remember that game by richard shepherd software does that ring any bell it doesn't but i think the, yeah. there are but thousands the, and thousands of games on the spectrum yeah so i bought that and i took it home and i remember loading it up and being eternally disappointed with what i saw mm. you know i spent what five pound fifty or wherever it was and then thinking you know is this it you know is it, well, what is this and i tried my best to try and like this game yeah but 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 then that's that's me then realizing at a young age there's good stuff out there and really bad stuff but yeah these these publishers will still take your money so i, I went to school the following monday i think i told this guy that introduced me to the spectrum all about my experience and he's then introduced me to crash yeah you have to buy magazines and they tell you you know what the rubbishy games are what the good games are and that was my then introduction to crash so we're talking about probably issue 10 11 into crash at that point yeah. i think by the time I, I bumped into it and then i probably bought crash religiously then i remember having it delivered by the local news agent in Larne, where, where i'm from in west wales yeah. we're talking two thousand people in the town me going to the news agent asking can i have a crash please and then the news agent never hearing of it and having to sort of order it in I stayed with Crash for probably a couple of years. Did you have the problem I had in that apparently there were two magazine, there were two magazines called Crash, um, so I had to go back a few a few weeks later and say it's called Crash Micro Games Action. <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I didn't have that problem. Oh, so that's that's good to know. <laughs> I, I just remember I just remember getting Crash, yeah, and I just yeah. remember being blown away by the covers. Trying to explain to my mum that this was a computer magazine from some yeah. of the covers, because you couldn't tell, could you, Ollie's art. You think, okay, this is a bit risque. Trying to explain to my mum, I know, I'm okay, mum, I'm, I'm 14, this is all okay. These are, it's just the yeah. art, and then flicking through and showing the, the, the contents in, in between. But I, I used to read, I, I, ne I was never interested in strategy games or the adventure section, but everything yeah. else, I used to just read every single word, and that became my Bible then, Crash. And there was all this talk about Crash Towers, if you remember, and yep. Ludlow and all these people. And if you think of me being in West Wales, you know, deep, dark West Wales, everything happened in, in the UK, in England, really, and a long, long, long way away. And I swear, Crash Towers, I, I had a vision of it as being a castle with towers back then. So um, having, see, having seen the building for real, just at the edge of Barclays and Ludlow, it, it didn't quite live up to my perception in my head, you know, of, of how this would be, but. It was still crashed towers to me. Yeah, I was exactly the same. By the way, I had a, images of it being a castle or something like that, and I'm sure we were yeah, the yeah. only ones. It, I used to look at the other magazines at the time because I picked Crash, and, and that was the one I picked. Yeah. You buy Sinclair user now and again, reading your Spectrum and your Sinclair. Yeah. I did like your Sinclair. That's where I bumped into Mega Basic and Mike Lehman's little application where you could put, program the Specy and give it Windows and all that kind of good thing. So, but it, it was Crash. I would get or subscribe to you know at least with the the post office where i would get it monthly i think my recollection was as well with crash that the other magazines just didn't have as good game reviews yours sinclair were much shorter yeah they were they would just give numbers wouldn't they like nine yeah. or eight or seven and same with sinclair user sinclair user was a little bit heavy wasn't it for a 14 year old some of the articles were a little bit too heavy for me so with Crash, it was, and also your Spectrum, your Sinclair, it was a, bit, a little bit yeah. more lighthearted. There were some longer ones in Crash as well. I remember the 3D or not 3D, which was in issue six or seven, I think, which was the first one I got. That was quite a long in-depth article. I, I loved it. Really, really liked it. I actually used to like Sinclair user as well. I used to buy loads of the magazines. There were so yeah. many back then, wasn't there? There were Sinclair Answers yeah. as well. I used to spend hours typing in listings. You know, that's how I learned it, learned how to code. You, you would type it all in, you would yeah. you think, okay, press run, error, yeah, you know, and you then would try and figure it all out. So so I loved all that. I spent hours just typing something in, just because you, you, you'd you have another game, wouldn't you? you you're you spending yeah. £5.50 on a game, you, you'd have, I don't know, Santa dropping presents down the chimneys, you know, those, those yeah. kind of standard kind of games or a horse racing kind of random betting game or something. It was, it was brilliant, a brilliant time. 
It was. It was absolutely amazing. And there's nothing equivalent now, really. I don't think there's as much anticipation now as there was. You would really look forward to getting your Crash magazine every month and looking at the latest games and things like that. Everything's a bit more immediate now, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think it's the accessibility as well. So yeah. there's so much content now on on itch, you know, or, or yeah. various other places on online. You know, games for free, or or you can donate uh, some some pounds or whatever. Yeah. But so back then, you 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 I know in some issues of Crash, they they boasted 300 games reviewed or whatever, but you could only afford one or two of them, couldn't you? So yeah, which is which is why the reviews were so essential. Yeah, so you had to, you had to pick your games very wisely, or just like that game I bought. You know, you, you I actually took that game back and and I wrote a story about it at the time, yeah. <laughs> dishonestly. I, I, I took it back to Smiths and, and and the guy behind the counter tried to load it onto the you know the, the Spectrum that yeah. was on show. He was called back to his desk as it was loading, and I pressed the break break space. <laughs> um, so it came up as our tape loading error. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, "See, yeah, I told you it wasn't working." And then they refunded me because you yep. because five pound back then was a, was a huge, huge amount. Of amount. Money. Moving on, going back to the business, I think you've answered kind of how you started and why you started it. When you started, did you think it would take off as well as it had? I mean, you've had a huge amount of successful Kickstarters, for example. Yeah, so I get I guess when we started this, I, I remember doing the Kickstarter with with Rog. Mm. and speaking to a number of people at ocean gary bracy was a, was a big big part of that early kind of chat for the ocean book yeah but but to be honest i had no idea how to design a book get it printed yeah uh get, get in something in design I, I did i didn't know anything about InDesign. how mm. to get something print ready roger has been a bit of a mentor to me over the years and he's taught me so much so I, i'm internally f- sort of grateful to rog and, and ollie yeah. but mainly Og- roger has been that person saying well no no, no this way no, no no that way telling me black is not really black you know and it's yeah. made up of this color that color this color i learned so, so much so when we did the ocean book i had no idea what we did i mean mm-hmm. you, you're talking the first kickstarter it was quite modest we're talking, I, I can't remember numbers, a couple of hundred, couple of hundred pledges. You know, I remember Rog telling me we, we've got a really good book here, but I didn't know whether we had or not because I had nothing to compare it against. Yeah. So, so sending that book out, we did, we did a launch party in in Kenilworth in in, in a, a sports and social club the other the, the other side of town, and we did a bit of a launch party. We got a lot of ocean people there, and maybe a hundred the people with ticket tickets to come to yeah. come along. Well, I think I think then, you know, we were getting it printed in the UK at that point, mm. which was not the wisest thing either, because the premium in the UK is, is extremely high for print. So there, there was so much to learn, Jeff. I had I, I was a I was a novice at this, trying to figure out my, my way through it all. You know, we, we would print 100 ocean books and then they would all go. We would print another 100 ocean books and they would all go. Yeah. So so there was no efficiencies in ordering these in numbers. The, the, the amount of cost for printing one of those books was equating to the price of the, per, you know, the person paying for it. I think we were charging yeah. or 15 quid for it or whatever, or whatever it was. But I was, I, my, my day job was my, my day job and, and yeah. doing stuff like this was something you would do on the side. Yeah. It, it, was a, yeah. it was a, it was a hobby project. Over the years then you sort of learn in design, you learn what bleed is, you learn, you know, what CMYK is and you learn design as well. And, and you, tr- and you know, you, you then I started creating things then what I would like to see you know I would like it to look like this yeah I'm, I'm, my, my view was well if I I'm the retro fan I'm, I'm the customer would wanting something like this then surely other people would appreciate that as well and that's how we sort of grew really I mean looking back at the ocean book now it is it's fairly um, simplistic I guess in its design compared to some of the things we did later on but it's, it's, I was just bringing everything I was doing back then. You were sort of bringing a core group of people along with with you on the journey, and then yeah. more more people would join in through word of mouth. I mean, in terms of the Ocean Book, it's incredible, really, how many how many we've sent out of that particular book. But that, it was mainly word of mouth and and good reviews, and because nobody had tackled it before, no, people were saying that you, we would never get the guys in a room, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and we did. Kickstarter has been a godsend. That's been the model I've used when when I've got a new idea. Yeah. 
I'm using it really as a marketing tool and testing the waters just to see if there is a, a, a need out there for another Spectrum book or another Commodore book or an Amiga book in terms of Crash and Zap. Um, I think I think with 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 those kind of Kickstarters, people enjoy the fact that there's a Kickstarter. It's, it's like an event. <laughs> so so um, so that that's that's become like an annual thing in itself, just doing a Kickstarter. You know, where people are asking when's the next Kickstarter for the next Crash annual. But but to answer your question, I, I would never have thought it would have grown to this. One, I, I, I was praying, probably, not well, praying, but I was hoping something like this would get some traction, and it has. So so, but I'm still very humble about this. That you know, um, I still want to create quality products, and I and I'm not, I don't take any project that I want to do for granted. So every time I do, and Roger can attest to this. Every time I do a Kickstarter. I'm beside myself with expectation and worry and you know that kind of thing still to to this day. No, nothing's a dead cert. I don't take anything for granted. Yeah, and I can imagine Kickstarter at least gives you the the kickstart for any new project that you want to do. It's it's like having a lot of advanced orders for something, isn't it? You just yeah. know exactly how many you're going to do. I also like that you tend to while you do a Kickstarter, you do then put it on your site and you do then continue the title. Which is always really good because sometimes people miss Kickstarters. Yeah, I tend to use something called Crowdox as well after mm. the Kickstarter ends. That's something I've been doing the last number of years. So even if people have missed the Kickstarter, they can still pledge. Yeah. Um, up to a point where I've got to put the orders in for the perks and or or, or the books. But yeah, the idea was to always have a store. Uh, the Kickstarter uh, sort of funds the creation of something, and then it also allows you to to, to get a few more. A few more of the of the item that you're you're sort of creating. Yeah. So and yeah, so that that so fusionretrobooks.com the store gets quite a, quite a lot of traffic daily. It was trying to build up the brand as well around the books that we were actually providing. I'd imagine you get a Christmas surge as well every year. Well, there's two things. There's the Kickstarters, which the, the delivery is an annual predominantly the last few years, so you've got yeah. to get them out. You get the second surge then. So when Crash came out early December or late November, early December, mm. other people then know it exists because this great retro community of ours, they, they love promoting and showing mm. the rest of the world what they've got, which, which is really, really great. So you've got that. And then you've got the, the, the surge of Christmas as well, where people are looking for the little book of Spectrum games to give yeah. three or four copies to their loved one, you know, so <laughs> just like in your case. <laughs> yeah. So you've got so Christmas was, was extremely busy and, and you've got to get to a point where it's normally around the 23rd of December where, you know, if people are sending you orders, then you haven't got much of a chance, really. No. So, so yes, yeah, a very busy time. But just just purely, we were hoping to get both Crash and Zap out for Christmas last year. And in the end, we, we, we with everything, we delayed, we got Crash out, as you know, and, and we delayed the, the Zap one until, well, it's coming out next month. But when I say Zap, you'd have to go bleep, bleep, bleep. I was, I was going to say it was the right decision to get Crash, do Crash <laughs> before Zap. Right. Okay. I'll I'll leave that for you to say, Jeff. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> this is the Spectrum show. <laughs> it definitely is. So you recently acquired the IP for Crash from Future Publishing. Yeah. Is that just Crash, or have you got the IP for any of the other Newsfield magazines? What Zap, Antics, Fear, I think, was one of those as well. Right. So it was purely for Crash and Zap. And there's a little bit of history. Yeah. In terms of the IP, Imagine Publishing acquired the rights from the Duchy of Lancaster some years ago of Crash and Zap. So when Imagine sold off to, to Future or, Fu- or Future bought Imagine, they acquired that IP as part of the sale. When we did the first Crash Kickstarter, Future got involved and we, we, we did a deal. And that, that, that was the deal in place for the first and second and third annual you know the, the deal i won't go into the ins and outs of it but what well, one part of it, it was that they retained the digital rights for example of the annuals yeah anything yep. we anything we created so i couldn't sell the pdf or i you know they they, yep. they put they put the the digital version on on their store that was that was a part of the deal the other deal was part of the deal was that we would put an advert into each of the annu, into the annuals for retro gamer so in, in our annuals you will flick over and you will see an advert for whichever the latest edition of retro gamer is yeah. And there was other there was other bits and pieces as well. So it was predominantly for Crash and Zap. So when we did the Zap annual, you know, we we had to go each time we did an annual, we would talk to Future and say, are we are we still okay to do this? Same terms and conditions, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
so that went on for a number of years and I, and I said to my contact there th there was a huge interest in us inquiring and owning the IP you know uh, obviously myself working with Roger and working with Ollie it, it, it would it would seem like a good full circle solution where yeah. the IP of something they created ended up back in Fusion Retrobooks family kind of a thing so the con so the the conversation for this started probably soon after the first annual was created back in 2017 and then over the over that period of time I would you know ask my contact any news any news any news and I, and I think then as you as you may know with Roger declaring or coming out with the fact he had motor neuro disease mm. at the end of last year there, there was an urgency and going back to future and saying well this is where we are at the moment guys you know it seems like this would be the right thing to do and just try and try and again and thankfully or thanks to future really they 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 allowed the the transfer of rights of the ip of crash and zap to come into fusion retro books ollie still owns the rights to the crash and zap logo between myself and ollie now and roger we we own the ip of crash yeah but it, it just covers crash and zap in terms of the other magazines i think fear is owned by i can't i can't recall the guy's name now but he I have been talking to him. They got with the guy who was the editor of Fear at the time. His name escapes me. In terms of Amtex, I think he's still in the wilderness. I don't know whether the Duchy of Lancaster has the rights. So Duchy of Lancaster is a place where all 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 unclaimed IP go. It's a holding ground for all dead IP if nobody has claimed it. So yeah, so Amtex, there was an idea of doing Amtex at one point, but I really don't think I'm trying to judge whether the audience is there. So we, 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 we've thought about doing it a couple of times, but we've gone back to something we know, like Crash, where we know there's a, a vibrant audience and, and, and a, an audience that are more than willing to help and support us, which we're very grateful for. Cool. Really pleased that you dropped in the IP. Well, I've got to pinch myself. I, um, yeah. I haven't, because we're so busy with stuff, sometimes I should sit back and acknowledge something we've done. The fact that I bought Crash back in those days, you know, and was I've been a big fan. I mean, I see Roger and Ollie frequently, and I keep telling them I'm seeing them as a fanboy. You know, I'm a friend, and they're, they're like my mum, mum and dad. I was going to say they're like, like my dad and dad. But sometimes I just need to sit back and acknowledge the fact that Crash and Zap have come back. Crash mainly for me was the, the magazine I had. I think I, I fell in love with the Commodore 64 a little bit later on because I never had one, you know, until much much later on in my life. So yeah, it's quite it's quite humbling, really. Especially now we're bringing Crash back as a as a magazine as well. It's uh, it's very humbling. And that kind of brings me on to my next question. So what are your plans for that IP? So we're doing Fusion, which is our other brand. So that that's me trying to get this kind of magazine urge out into into the wild. So Fusion was A5. Uh, we did a Fusion A5 annual. And, and 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 the whole brand has proven very popular. Fusion looks at looks at all gaming, computer gaming, board gaming, toys, a anything that can go under the umbrella of gaming. We sort of delve into a little bit within within the the brand of Fusion. You know, A5 in, in my view works. Everything has got smaller these days. You know, with all these mini computer this and mini, mini computer that and micros yeah. or whatever. So we thought let's do an A5 magazine, 60 pages. Uh, we'll, we'll do an A5 binder. And we will do an annual behind it, which which has proven even more successful. So I think Fusion as a brand is is proven very proved very successful for myself and the team working behind it. Nothing to do with Roger or Ollie either. So I didn't want to burden them with anything else. They, they, yeah. Roger does write monthly for it. Roger and Ollie, I can help. I, they they can carry on doing the design for for Crash, and we we look after Fusion. I guess then with knowing well, the the idea I suppose was just to just to see if we could transfer that kind of feel. The feel of, of of a crash annual into a into a, an A5 60 page magazine, yeah. which would which would feel like crash but be something different. So so we we looked at you know the, the templates for the reviews for crash, some of the regular slots like screen yeah. string or Lloyd Mangrum's forum, condensed it down into a template and just to see if it would work. So the idea was to use Ollie's art from yesteryear. So when yeah. when we did issue one of we would call it uh, Crash Micro Action just to make it a little bit different. 
we would use the art from yesteryear, but zoom in a little bit and make it a little, the focus of that art a little bit different to differentiate yes. from where it was in A4. Uh, a lot of people wanted the, the magazine to be A4, but with A4, you, you need a different set of skills. You need more yeah. t- you need more writing, you need more, you know, more everything and it costs more. So with A5, we went down this route and we, we created a patron and again, overwhelmed by the response, really. I think there's a thousand and forty odd patrons at the moment yeah. for Crash. We, we sent we, the idea as well with the, the last annual Kickstarter was that we would one of the stretch goals was to create a sampler. I don't know if you recall that. Yeah, where we, is that where we, issue zero? Issue zero, but it, it would be. The content in there would be the same that would be in issue one. Yeah. It's just 28 pages or so of it, just to give everybody a taster of, of what we were trying to do. And I think when that arrived with the annual before Christmas, there was a surge of people then joining the patron. I think we won them over, won over yeah. many people with the look and feel. On, on, and it was only a sampler because it's, it's kind of flimsy. It's only 28 pages. It's more yeah. like a, a pamphlet, really. But with the 60 page and the the high the high gloss cover, you got the weight as well, and, and it's, it's quite a nice thing to flick through. It is, I agree. I, I have issue one. You have issue one? Yeah, okay. I have, and, and issue zero. If you feel both of them, you, you could probably guess where I'm getting at. The yeah. 60 page, the weighting of a 60 page magazine, it just feels right. And, and the, pam- the, the, the sampler feels worried like it is, really. It's just a, yeah. a, it's a taster. So, yeah, so we, we did issue one. We sent out, I think I've sent out about 14, 1,500 copies of that in total. Because you got the patron and you got people buying them on the site as well. And the idea was to do them quarterly, yeah. So because it does take a lot of effort to do one of these, but the team that have been working on this crash is so such a good bunch of guys. We we, we feel now that we can do these bi-monthly, as in, I always wonder with bi-monthly, does, does that mean two a month or does it mean yeah. <laughs> one every two months? Yeah. But we we are we're bringing them out every every couple of months now. So issue two is literally just landed to the patrons i sent the pdf out to them yesterday yeah. feedback has been incredible already so that will go to print now probably monday and then we'll send that out in probably about a week's time um and then we're already working on issue three we know what we're trying to do the first one was a bit of an experiment in terms of length of reviews amount of text you know how many words yeah. but now we got a nice look and feel we're still playing with the columns in, as you will see in issue two, we tried to replicate. Well, I tried to replicate the, the feel and look of issue of, of, of issue one against issue one of of Crash. Yeah. So we, we we did four columns. Yeah. Which, which I think of, of issue two has started to do this. We're going to go to three columns. So there's more text per per line in each of the columns. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So so we're learning and we're trying to see what works. There's going to be a website behind this as well called CrashMagazine.co.uk. I've just got to launch that. Um, the, the domain is there. There's a number of emails now behind that, like Lloyd Mangrum or LM at crashmagazine.co.uk. We're, we're, we're building that brand. And then we did the A5 binders as well. And I don't know if you had one of those, but I sent out 500 of those free to the first 500 people on Patreon. And that's quite a nice keepsake as well. So everything is condensed into A5. Will you still make the magazines available on your website as well? Yeah, so issue one is on the website at the moment. You can download the sampler for free, the PDF. But what I did with the sampler, we got 3,000 of those printed and sent out many free ones to whoever buys anything else on the site. So if you you bought something on the site today, there's a very good chance. Unless it's a Commodore 64 book, you would get a free cross sampler. Issue two will be on the site. Probably it's just a matter of getting around to doing it probably tonight or tomorrow. The, the printed copies will be back from the printer. It takes normally a week turnaround. So I can imagine I'll be sending quite a few out now, probably a week Monday. I must admit, I haven't backed the Patreon at the moment. I bought issue one off the site. Yeah, um, fine. Which, do, which does mean I missed out on that binder, which I'm a bit disappointed about, if I'm honest, Chris. <laughs> well, I try and give some free things on, on the Patreon. One of one other yeah. thing that we're doing on the Patreon, which, I, which is the embedded... Flipbook, you, I, I sent um, you guys a URL. I know, I know, I know you, you can have a look at it. But yeah. it, so, one, one, so we're trying to think, we're trying to think what we can give the patrons in addition to the magazine. There's, there's early view of the covers, but then you know the fact that we're using the covers from Ollie back in the day, yeah. people sort of know what the covers look like anyway. But the other idea was to have an have a like an interactive version of the the PDF, which which we call a flipbook. 
Yeah. So what that allows me to do is that you can you can you can embed music, you can embed videos, you can you can put links in play. So if you click them, it goes to the website of the the person selling the game that we've just reviewed. So it adds, a, I mean, and that seems to have gone down really well with the patrons. Mm -hmm. So that that's one thing. Uh, and we're trying to think of other things like the the aluminiums of the cover, like aluminium prints of the covers. We we could we could give as as a, as a yeah. tier. Which is already there for Crash. As we do issue uh, three, for example, of Crash, then you could be on the tier where you get an aluminium print of the Sherlock image. Yeah, which which is issue three yeah. of Crash original back in the day. So we're trying to think of different ways to to engage the Crash guys, and obviously they they get the printed copy first as well before before I actually send out any of the ones off the site that they they will get a printed copy. And, and I'm sure there will be other opportunities over the next months to to give out more stuff to 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 their sort of support. But I get I get asked quite a few times, you know, what what's the benefit of me joining the Patreon? And you know, we try and give out more things, but it also allows me to gauge how many copies of the magazine to print as well. Yeah, it's like a subscription service. So there's that as well. Cool. I think I'll go and join the Patreon. I and think call that you should, Jeff. And whilst you're there, get Paul to join as well. <laughs> I'll I'll try. Have you got any other plans? One thing I thought of is doing reprints of some of the old magazines. Maybe a, an issue one in full colour, kind of remastered. We've talked about this, me and Rog. So, so, so if you think of Crash issue one, so mm. the, the the cover belongs to Ollie, the artwork on the logo. Yeah. The insides then belong to. So so if Derek Brewster wrote an article in issue one. Yeah. The rights the rights of that article will return to him. And that, that that's the current setup that's in place from yeah. the contracts they had back in the day. So to, to print an exa to print a copy of issue one, you would have to go through each page and determine who wrote the piece on that page yeah. and then seek permission for reprint. That that that'd be one thing. I mean that that, that wouldn't be so difficult in this day and age. Mm. I guess the second challenge then would be to either recreate the page or to dig digitize it and then tidy it up. Now, we, we did a Jetman book, which you may have seen last year. I have. Uh, yeah, and that's what we did with that. We we scanned each of the comic strips in at very high res, and the skills of Mr. Keane again come into the, the fray. Yeah. Come into the fray. See what I did there? He then made them good, yeah, to the point, and, and we printed them, not in CMYK because we work very closely with our printer. We, we we printed them in RGB, which meant that the the inks just sort of shout out on the page. So we we could do it like that, but that that is a, a lot a lot of work to digitize each of those images. I mean, the magazines themselves these days are deteriorating with age. It's that kind yeah. of quality of paper that Crash unfortunately was printed on back in the day. It's, it's a nice thought though, Jeff, isn't it? To have a yeah. kind of a nice flashy sort of um, brand new reprint of issue one, for example. It, it may, it may. I'm not saying no. It may happen, but there's no plans at the moment. Were you aware that there was somebody had digitised a lot of Crash already and made them available online? Yeah, there's there's a guy uh, called Mort. I don't know if you're talking about the same guy, Stephen Stuttard. He's he's digitised many magazines and made them available. Yeah. So I talk to Steve quite regularly. So I've, I've got access to some good source. It's just a matter of the, the time and and whether there's there's a motivation to do that at the moment. Yeah. I'm sure if you did, an issue, an issue one in particular would be incredibly popular. Unprecedented <laughs> as well, because I don't think anyone's, pe people are doing a lot of new stuff around retro games, but no one's, no one's kind of going back and sort of reproducing things as they were. I'll, I'll talk to Rog. We'll, we'll see if we can do something in that space. Will the excellent crash annuals continue? That's that's the other 64 million question, isn't it? So a lot of people yeah. will be asking me that. So Rog, Roger. In the current circumstances, as the, the the crash we did, crash 2021 would be his last. There's there's two options I guess I've got here. So Nick Roberts, who has been doing the the playing tips for yeah. Crash, Nick worked for for Newsfield back in the day. He's quite adept as well in in design. So he has offered to to take the mantle over from Roger, at least in the the design space. Now I now I guess as we're doing the A, as I'm doing the A5 design for for Crash. It gives me a lot more experience as well in the look and feel of what Crash is all about. So, so there's scope there now to to be able to carry on doing the annual. Again, it's just the content that it's the time, I guess, is the 
is the important bit now in in that space to create an A4 crash annual. The alternative is to to do an A5 crash annual like we do for Fusion. Yeah. Where it's 120 pages. It, it'll be the look and feel of what the A5 is, and it'll be the look and feel, I guess, of what the A4 was. We we have a lot more skills in that space, and it would be something that would be easily much more easily done than an A4 one. Not to say that's the way we've decided to go, but that, that's another option. And the other challenge we've got now as well is we are we are doing a bi-monthly magazine. Yeah. And that's likely then to clash into whatever the annual could have been or would have been. And how do we differentiate an annual from the December issue of a crash microaction, for example? So there's a few things to figure out in my head at the moment on how we're going to do this. Because I think the annuals themselves, I mean, the annuals back in the day were never hardback. Sorry, I'll rephrase that. The magazines back in the day, whenever hardback, is something we we thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to do an annual? Now, the the annuals now have become a part of the crash legacy, I guess. But well, I guess before we did an annual, no one really thought about what we were going to do. So I guess with if we did go to A5, there's going to be some some guys, I guess, and guys and girls who would probably n- not think that would work. But I guess what I would be saying if we do go down that path was just to trust us because we know from experience the fusion annual just feels so yeah. nice. It's a well, good I'm question, quite... though, Jeff. It's the yeah. trickiest question you've asked so far. I think either would work, either A4 or A5. As I said, I suppose you, you've got the magazines from back in the day in, your, in their binders or, or, or in your shelf as yeah. A4 magazines. They were over time. We've done we've done three annuals now in Crash World, which which will sit somewhere in your, in your bookshelf. We're, we're into a new chapter now, I guess, with the A5. We're trying to persuade the the people who like the A4 size magazine to come on board and give it a try. And and then if we do, do if we do go down the route with the A5 annual, then to trust us, you know, that we will make it look and feel like Crash. But it's the it's the evolution, it's the next stage now of Crash. Yeah. So, and, many- and Ollie's also uh, more than happy to do a cover for it as well, whichever yeah. format we decide. Or uh, Ollie is still saying he will more than happily do another cover. I think one of the things for me as well is when I read the sampler and then issue one of Crash. It very much felt like that was the magazine of the annual. So in, ter- in terms of the magazine, a lot of people have said to me, it, it feels more crash than the annual. So I take that as a, as a big compliment, I guess. It's more more of a continuation. You know, you, you gain something in the post regularly. You know, we, we said quarterly initially, but bi-monthly, you know, it, it, it comes around quite quick. We're trying, and then we need to try and figure out how to make the annual something else, something else a bit more special, you know. Yeah. And we're we're still working on that at the moment because the Commodore guys will be asking for the same thing. Have you thought of asking Ollie to do more Jetman strips for the annual, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> we we did a new strip. We did a new strip for 2018 annual. And that appeared in the Jetman book. And he did one more strip then for the Jetman book. And that was the uh, continuation of the story to an end. So what they did in that double page new strip was take his adventures and then bring it to a logical end. So, yeah. no, there won't, they won't be any more. It's, it's a lot of hard work to do those. I mean, Ollie didn't yeah. do them back in the day. So he, he, he sort of did them as, as a tribute, really, for the first annual and, and then as a, as, a, as a conclusion to the story in, in, in the Jetman book. Yeah. Ollie yeah. did do Terminal Man, didn't he? He did. That, that was that was his. Um, and, I, and I broached him on that as well. And that's not going to happen either. Well, <laughs> so. if, he, if he's not going to do Jetman, then Terminal Man looked like it was a lot more work in the original magazine so i'm sure yeah i've been, I've been so appreciative of, of ollie doing the artwork for these covers i mean he's had yeah. to go back to old school you know with airbrushes and inks and various things yeah. and you know there's, there's a skill and there's an old art form when it comes to that kind of painting and and the, the, the tools he's using i suppose are not getting any younger and and roger's telling me or oh, the ink is sprayed all over this and that it's got blocked or what you know highly privileged really to have this new art on on these on these new annuals in terms of in the comic strips i mean all these rolly and roger well roger wrote them and all he did the art for them and, and it was a privilege having those but they, they do take a lot of work because it's not something he's mimicking somebody else's style i guess grateful for what he's done and i'm not going to ask <laughs> for any more my, my mum used to love Jetman, by the way, she used to read them. There's one that she still talks about. There's one where he, he's using a mine in an intergalactic conquer competition. 
and uh, his competitor keeps saying it's a mine it's a mine and uh, jet man says please can someone tell that turkey it's not it's not his it's mine <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> she yeah. still talks about that to this day. That she's she's talked about that since she read it back in the eighties. I was going to ask how long it takes the magazine to write, but from what you've said, it sounds like pretty much two months. It sort of writes itself at the moment. The the, the hardest part was getting the template there. Yeah. And, and then what? So what I was doing, I was I was in InDesign. I would have the A5 template open in one window. And then I would have one of Roger's annuals open in the other. Yeah. So by, by doing Crash and, and doing Zap, they are subtly different. I, I didn't want to put Zap aspects into Crash and vice versa. So so getting the word count for the reviews, you know, a double page review, just, just looking at the amount of content Roger used to, has been putting in these annuals and also each of each of the issues and trying to trying to mimic that, you know, when to put an Ollie bug in place, when not to put an Ollie bug. Because you could mm. just because you you can doesn't mean you really should you know but so it's, it's a bit of a balancing act i think the longest bits of time at the moment is not creating the magazine but the proofing and getting it just yeah. right just so that you know because i know there's such a high expectation from me the team and also the readers to make everything as perfectly crashed as we possibly can i think the content is there jeff there's loads of great stuff happening in the spectrum scene uh, there's great games coming out, and I guess doing Crash as well has given me, you know, excuses to to fire up the Spectrum and have a play of these new games. Yeah, and yeah, and I, I love the AY music on some of these games as well. We've got to do a feature on on some of the the tunes. They're just incredible. Um, yeah, that, that would go nicely yeah. with your flip book idea as well, wouldn't it? Of yeah. So we're, we're we're putting the AY tunes in as separate sound bites against some of the reviews, you know, and. Yeah. Some of the music's absolutely incredible, you know, and, and sometimes, remember, remember the old sort of days you used to load up a game just to listen to the music, yeah? Yeah. And that's what I'm doing with the emulators. I'm just firing up, like, color, coloristic and, and various, various other games. The the new Dizzy game has got incredible music, yeah? Just, just to listen to the tunes. Yeah, so, so it's giving me an opportunity now doing Crash to, to play the games again. You know, play all the new games. I'm doing a lot of the second reviews on, on some of these games as well. So I've got to play them. I'm absolutely loving it. I agree. When I do things for the Spectrum show, sometimes when I do game reviews in particular, playing them has been great. Uh, that that uh, Aliens Neo Plasma, I was I was mm. meant to capture a couple of screens. And like five hours later, I was still playing it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like, yeah. this is not this is not efficient use of time. <laughs> so, you know, if I was if I went, I meant to be grabbing two screens for a, for a review, and then five hours later, you're still playing the game. If you do that on every single game, you get nothing done. There's some of these games, you know, they're even on the humble spec, you know, they're incredible games. Yep, they definitely are. What people can do these days is absolutely incredible. Was it difficult getting people like you mentioned, Nick Robinson, or is it Robbins? Yeah, like Nick playing Bob. tip. Yeah, and you've got some yeah. others as well. I think the guy Technic is one of the old. Yeah, so so. Well. So it's Nick Roberts. I've known Nick for a little while. Uh, well, how's right? He came to some of the revival events. So you, you sort of just ask him. You, you yeah. ask if he wants to be involved. Simon Goodwin is the guy from Technish. He lives down the road from me. He lives in just outside Warwick. Simon came to my first event, the one I mentioned earlier in 2005. So yeah. I've known Simon a long, long time. Asking him if he, he wanted to come back on board doing this. There was no hesitation. So we've got Nick, we've got Roger, we've got Ollie, we've got Simon. I'm trying to think who else we've had. I think that's about it in the crash space, isn't it? Well, you got Paul Davis as well. I'm pres- is that is that the Paul Davis or just a no? Paul Davis? Paul, no, Paul's a Paul Davis. He wasn't involved back in the day. Yeah. So, so if there's others out there that want to, you know, be a part of Crash, you know, I, I would love that to happen. Yeah. But if you if you remember with with Crash, it was a little bit different back in the day. Well, we've had Matthew Fundal as well. So back in the day with Crash, it was all the local school kids doing all the reviews, if you recall. Yeah. And this is what I tried to recreate with Crash was having people who, you know, they're, they're not journalists. Yeah, they're not they're not yeah. recognized names back then anyway. And they, they would contribute. And then what I found with uh, the, the, the lately with the annuals and with, especially with Crash magazine, we've got Gordon King and Paul Davis, who are the um, and myself who, who are reviewing the games and we make a good team. And to, is is Gordon that. King the Gordon King from RGDS? Yes, I thought it was. So we make a good team sort of uh, doing some balanced reviews. And, and I think it's important getting the three of us yeah. doing the reviews each month. The readers then can have a take, I guess, on, well, you know, well, Chris would say that he doesn't like flight simulators or something, you know? Yeah. 
there's sort of is some kind of consistency then if we give something a, a crash smash then you, you know it's sort of it's been rewarded appropriately yeah which was true back in the day as well yeah if you talk to rog yeah you know but back in the day i guess you'd have these big companies paying large amounts of money for advertising and then only to have their game gain a poor mark so uh, i know i know roger and dolly and the co were were adamant that the mark stood you know no, no matter yeah. what they paid in advertising in this day and age i guess a lot of these games are free you know you can download them for free so it's trying to give an honest view of of what we think of a game but people should go and try it and make it make up their own minds anyway because you know just because this, this is our opinion guys but feel free to go and download and, and, and make your own decision because it's it, it, there's no impact on cost it's just time isn't it so. yeah i bought delta shadow based on the review in i think it was in crash issue one i, I like the um in issue two we we we've reviewed mars May, which i started playing that again another one where just just another hour it's one of those games that just absorbs you in We've got Craig Turner doing all the the next reviews, and, and yeah. he, he did a really long next article in issue one, which got some really really good feedback. Craig's a very passionate Spectrum Next supporter, yeah. so we, we've got him on board. I think the other guys want to do some reviews on the next as well, but we're, we're trying to keep Craig to be the the guy on 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 the next space. So it's a bit of a balancing act, really. We've got an article for issue three of Crash by Craig, which is looking at the games that ran really slowly on the the humble specy games like Test Drive and you know the yeah. things that that were maybe three or four frames per second, and he's putting those kind of games through the next on 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 the enhanced mode just to see how the games play. That that's a good feature for issue three, uh, and then he he plays all the latest games uh, as you can see in this one. He's got his QB is in this one. So yeah, so the next is a big part of of Crash going forward. It's, it's the now really, isn't it? Yeah, QB is an excellent game as well. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to play it, but reading what, what I find I'm doing as well. Uh, I, I do this with Fusion as well. I read the reviews that other people do, and then I go and buy the game. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. Because the, the 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 reviewer sold it to me. I mean, Simon Butler writes a, rev- a couple of reviews or a reviewer a couple of reviews every issue of Fusion. He yeah. picks an indie. I go and say, go and pick an indie game you really like, Sai, and write about it. And then you, you can hear the passion coming through in his writing. And then then end up having all these games on Steam I've never played. Yeah. I bought them, but I never played. I've never had a chance to play them based on his reviews. Simon and I go way back, yeah. So yeah, if I if I go back to the Ocean Book as the first book, he's in there. Then he's in, I think he's in all the Spectrum Volume 1, 2, and 3. He's in the yeah. Commodore book. He's in the Amiga book. Yeah. Simon's been a great and loyal friend to me for years now. He loves contributing. He's contributed to every issue of Fusion. He's now contributing to Crash. Well, he, he did anyway, the annuals. You know, the screens. He was looking at, because he... Yeah. He's a pixel artist. He was picking the best screens for the annual. So we're doing we're doing that for the magazine as well. So I'm just looking at now, trying to see if he can write other things for Crash, mm-hmm. and um, in terms of you know, like 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 a regular feature. So when it when it comes to Fusion, as I say, he writes an indie review. It, yeah. The review is what it is. We we for the for the annual, he picked his best Ocean games, the games he you know he enjoyed most at Ocean. I'm a big fan. Of, I'm a big fan of Mr. Butler. Me too. His content's really really good, and I agree. His passion does come through in his his writing. Um, yeah. You did remind me of something I thought. I think it was when I read the annual. Simon's said a few times, I think, in the annual that he, he struggles not to pick loads and loads of screens by a particular artist. For the magazine, he could just focus on one artist. I think we've done that once, haven't we? Where yeah. he he, he, he bumped into an artist and he saw so much stuff, good stuff by this one artist yeah. that he, he made the whole, the whole thing around that particular guy. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Simon... I'm happy to, to take his lead on this kind of stuff and, and just mix it all up a little bit. Yeah. But uh, we'll, we'll keep the screen, the screen string in place in Crash. It's, it's, I think it's a very nice couple of pages, just given his view on some of the art which is out there, which is, I guess, an aspect of the spectrum we, we never really considered too much. But if you look at the some of this, I, I, I was playing Wonderful Dizzy yesterday because I was, I was just playing yeah. a little bit to do a video for the flipbook. And some of the art on there, accompanied by the the AY music, yeah, it's unbelievable. I, I can't recall any games ever looking that good back in the day or sounding that good. Very very rare. It's a nice different section as well. As you go through the annual or the magazine, when you get to his section, it's like, all right, Simon now. 
quite refreshing to have something that isn't just about games. It's Spectrum related, but it isn't games. Same with Technic as well. Yeah, yeah. It's the break. It's like, it's like the intermittent break between main, main meals, isn't it? It's like the snack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so yeah. So we'll, we'll carry on doing that. And that concluded my interview with Chris. As I said at the start of the interview, I hope you all enjoyed it. I did. I really enjoyed talking to Chris. In fact, I think in the interview he said that he felt like a fanboy with Roger and Oli Frey. And I kind of felt the same when I was interviewing Chris. It was great to have him on board and somebody who's done so much for the retro gaming community, particularly the Spectrum retro gaming community. So until next time, happy gaming!